4, I'm sorry, look at verse 12. Hebrews chapter 4. Actually, went on down in chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4. Now, we have services all the way through the holidays. Uh, this is the coldest November on record already in ain't but the 5th. Uh, got down to 21, they say, in Asheville this morning. And that's fine with me. Amen. Uh, but we have services all the way through the winter. If it snows a foot, we'll be here anyway. So you don't ever have to worry about it being too cold, too hot, too wet, too much snow. The doors will be open if we can get here. Don't even have to watch the news or nothing. Hebrews chapter 4, and look at verse 16. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. I titled the message this morning, the last few words of that verse, Grace to Help. In time of need. Grace to help. In time of need. That's what I'm preaching on this morning. Grace to help. In time of need. There's two words that ought to make a Christian shout every time he hears them. One of them is blood. The other is grace. When we hear somebody mention the blood of Jesus, we ought to have a shout in our soul. And when we hear somebody mention the grace of God, we ought to have a shout in our soul. This morning I want to preach just a little bit. I can't uh, totally grasp the meaning. I don't think it's humanly possible. The man with the greatest oratorical abilities could not accurately describe the grace of God. I honestly feel very, very weak uh, this morning trying to even touch the subject of God's amazing grace. But I will say a few things about it this morning. I have several other messages to preach on grace, but this is the first time I've ever preached this like I'm going to give it to you this morning. Find grace to help in time of need. Now, there's five things I want to say about grace this morning that I believe will help you a long way and give you some help this morning. The first of all, uh, when you think about grace, you automatically... Think about saving grace. Saving grace. You know, it took the grace of God to save you. You're not saved this morning because you're a good church member. You're not saved or going to heaven this morning because you, you're you better than somebody else. Uh, a lot of times church people look down on other people and think, Boy, ain't we glad we're not like them. But the truth is this morning, but for the grace of God, any one of us could be out there in the ditch or in the gutter this morning. But for the grace of God, I, I could be in, in a drunken stupor somewhere, not even knowing where I am. But for the grace of God, you could be in drug rehab this morning, uh, not even knowing your name. But for the grace of God, you could be looking out through jail uh, uh, bars this morning. But for the grace of God, you could be sitting in a court tomorrow morning on your way to prison for a life sentence. But for the grace of God, I'm glad for saving grace. Amen. I was lost 18 years, uh, when I was 18 years old. My, you've heard my testimony. My mother took me to church when I was little. It was my mother that put the fear of God and the Word of God in my heart when I was three and four and five and six years old. That's why I stressed you mamas how important your job is when you have little children. And my mom told me the greatest story ever told. Well, when we moved to Nebo when I was six, we moved from Clinchfield to Nebo. Uh, my, we didn't have a car. Daddy took the car and was gone with it. We didn't have a way to church. And little by little, the, the family sort of got out of church. My mom stayed in uh, going to sing different places with her, with her sisters and them. But we got out. When I grew up, 10, 11, 12, 13, didn't go to church. 14, didn't go to church. 15, didn't go to church. And through my years in high school, I, I, I would be out uh, doing something I shouldn't have done. Maybe it was somebody I shouldn't have been with. A bunch of boys getting, getting in some kind of mess, getting in trouble. Deep down inside, I knew that God. 
You remember feeling like that? I knew there was a heaven and a hell. I knew that I'd have to face God one day. Well, uh, when I was 17, I went to church a couple of times with a friend of mine. It meant absolutely nothing to me. I knew I was supposed to be there and I felt guilty if I didn't go. But when I went, I got absolutely nothing out of it. And then they had that revival at Nebo Baptist Church. 14 miles up the road on that road right out there on the left. And that church had revival services. My pastor, Brother Hall Hollifield, prayed and God the revival on his heart. He called an old preacher by the name of Joe Parson. Joe Parson would get up about 5 o'clock in the morning, pray and get with God two or three hours. And they had a lady up there that fasted for three days and then went three more, a total of six days. The Holy Ghost came around and started moving in that community. I heard about one of my uh, 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 friends at school who had got saved. And uh, this boy got saved. Now, when they told me he got saved, I couldn't believe it. That was on Sunday night. And then on Monday, I heard about other people getting saved. I told cousin, we was out school playing ball. I said, let's go up there and see what's going on. There was something put a little hunger in my heart. There was an era of conviction down in my soul. You remember that? I, I seen Brother Darren up there shouting a minute ago when they was singing because he told me it was five years ago last Sunday when the Lord saved him and his wife in our, in our first Sunday school campaign. I told me Jeremy getting a blessing because it was like three years ago when he got saved. Brother Derek was talking about people who get saved and stick in there. Boy, there's one, there's some, there's others. Everybody, everybody don't get a dud. Everybody don't get a counterfeit. They got the real thing. Well, I went that first night on Tuesday night and me and my cousin looked in the back door and we looked in the back door and it was packed full and my hair was long and I thought they'd talk about me. I said, I ain't going in for done standing up singing. The devil said, leave, leave, leave. And so I had a little OMG, uh, just two-seater thing, you know. I had to run around Nebo with the top down on that thing. We hopped in that thing and left. Well, the next night we came back and uh, my cousin uh, who worked at the store there, my uncle owned that store and that's Linda Houck's dad, uh, her sister Jackie invited me. She said, Danny, why don't y'all come to our revival? Well, the next night we went. And I went, and that night a group got up and started singing. And boy, they started singing the power of God was in church. Let me tell you something. There is nothing in this world that will get the job done uh, like a church that's got the power of God in that church. And that, that night God started speaking to my heart. And man, I felt it tugging. And my cousin said, hey man, let's go get saved. I said, I'm not ready to get saved. You've heard me tell it probably some of you getting tired of it I'm going to tell you if the Lord lets me live you're going to get tired of it I'm never going to quit telling what he done for me that night I'm never going to get over what Jesus done for my soul on that night in April and I'll tell you what brother thing I know I, I said I'm going I took a step out he took a step out and down the aisle I went I fell down on my face that night. I could get about right here. The altar was full. And I fell down bawled like a baby. I mean, I started bawling. I, everything, it, it felt like throwing up. That's what it felt like. Blah, you know, all that old junk and all that old sin and all that old fear and all that old uh, uh, worry just went blah right out there that night. And somebody got down beside me and said a prayer. I don't remember what they said. I remember somebody had their hand on me and said something. I, I'm doing business. I wasn't paying no attention to uh, what they're saying. And you know, the old song said, tears are a language that God understands. And the Lord took my tears and He knew my... And He said, I'll give you what you need. That night I stood up, honest to goodness, I felt like I had a bath on the inside. I sat down on the front row. Somebody hugged my neck after church. said, boy, I'm proud of you, Danny. You're going to be a preacher. I went, ha, ha, that's what you think. I told me the very first night I got saved. And the old preacher got up. Brother Joe, never seen him before. He never seen me. He looked right down and pointed his finger at me and said, Did you get everything straight, son? I said, Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I wouldn't have told him no, even if I didn't know if he got it straight. And boy, I scared of him. And buddy, I'll tell you, I mean, it was like an old prophet stepped out of the Bible and was pointing at me. Well, that night I went home and I told Mom, you've heard me tell it. Oh, I won't take time to tell my whole testimony, but I'm going to tell you something. Grace did a work in the heart. Do you remember when the grace of God saved you? I'm telling you, brother, there's saving grace. And I wouldn't be here this morning standing in front of you if it wasn't for them amazing saving grace of God 
Hallelujah. Thank God. I'm glad for His grace this morning. You know, said uh, uh, there's an old story. You've heard it different ways. But I, uh, the story that I read, it was an old uh, fellow by the name of Old Bull. And he was a Norwegian violinist back in the 1800s. And he was an expert violinist. Absolutely the best in the world. And they said he got lost in the woods one night in Europe. And he was going through a forest over in Europe. And he stumbled upon this man's house. And an old hermit lived in this house. He said, uh, well, the, old, the old violinist went in there, didn't tell him who he was, and he went in and sat down and began to talk to him. And over here on the shelf, there was an old, uh, scratchy, look, beat up old violin. Had cobwebs on it, old strings on it, and the, and the great master there, of course, he said, Oh, I want, I would, I'd like to hear a violin. And the old hermit got it and said, It ain't much. He went, meep, 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 meep. You know, play. And he said, This thing ain't much. It's old. It ain't no count. And he said, Well, let me see it. And boy, he took that old violin, and you know, he, he wiped off the dust off of it, you know. And you know, he rubbed off the neck of that thing, you know. And, and he said, You know, he tuned it a little bit, and he touched it, and then he got that bow, and he began to play. And boy, he played the most beautiful music, filled that room. And and everybody said, I can't believe that old music is coming out of that old sorry, that old sorry violin is producing such beautiful music. They said, I can't believe that that old sorry, good for nothing old violin has such wonderful melody coming out of it. And they said, you know what the difference was? They said the difference wasn't in the violin. The difference was the touch of the Master's hand. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Now, I'm telling you what, somebody looked at me and said, I can't believe old Danny Castle... Oh, sorry, good for nothing, Dan. You know why? Because I had the touch of the Master's hand upon my life. And I'm telling you this morning, that's what saving grace is. It's the touch of the Master's hand on your life. Hallelujah. Thank God. I'm glad He touched me one day. Let your mind go back to that night He touched you. I like that song that says, He touched me. Oh, He touched me. And oh, the joy that flooded my soul. Something happen. And, uh, and now I know that I'm made whole or whatever. I'm glad that He touched me. That's saving grace this morning. If saved, you know what I'm talking about. Amen. That's saving grace. Amen. It's the unmerited, undeserved, unrecompensed favor of God, brother, on your life. Let me tell you something, brother. The religious world wouldn't give me time of day. Most churches said they will never make it. There ain't no hope for it. And they still wouldn't. But I'm glad, brother, that there's something in God that's the heart of all His redeeming qualities and activities called grace. And somebody said it's G-R-A-C-E. Uh, God, uh, uh, God's grace. Amen. It's God's riches at Christ's expense. Brother, he, we got the riches. He paid for it. He paid a debt He didn't know. I owed a debt He didn't. I didn't, couldn't pay. We swapped off and it was saving grace. But I want to say secondly this morning, I'm going to talk about schooling grace. Schooling grace. For time's sake, you don't have to turn to it. But Titus chapter 2 and verse 11 said, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation, we've already talked about that, to all, hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, godly in this present world. Now, I'm going to tell you something. I'm glad not only for saving grace, I'm glad for schooling grace. Did you know when you, go, when you get saved, God puts you in school. You enroll in the school of God. And by the way, in the school that I'm talking about, there are no graduates walking around down here. Some people give you the impression they've graduated. They don't need to learn nothing else. They've done a ride. You ever met these people that they're like, I've arrived. I'm at the top. I can't go no higher spiritually. I'm going to tell you something. When you get saved, you enter in school. And God puts you in school and starts teaching you. And you don't graduate until you get rid of this body and get a new one and take you on to heaven. That's when you're going to graduate. There ain't no graduates, uh, graduates walking around down here. And I'm going to tell you something this morning, brother. God, by His grace, puts you in school. I'm, I hadn't been saved 24 hours. Then I began to learn things. And whatever that was that saved me started teaching me. And, and brother, it teaches me. It teaches you. Did you know this? You don't have to have you don't have to have a college education to learn what's right and what's wrong. All you've got to do is get saved. You instinctively know what's right 
and what's wrong. I don't know these people going around saying, well, I don't know. I don't know what sin, what is it. I'm going to tell you what the grace of God will do. The Bible said the grace of God will teach you to deny ungodliness. Listen, the very night I got saved, from then on when I did something wrong, I knew I'd done something wrong. It'll teach you. It'll teach you. And I'm telling you, it began to work on me. I, we see the others' lives ruined by sin. That's God's grace teaching us. We see faces at funeral homes. You know what? When I go to a home and I see people weeping and I see the person laying there, God's grace is teaching me. It's teaching you, son, that's going to happen to you one of these days. Son, you see how they... Now all that matters is heaven and hell. That's God's grace teaching you. When you go to church and the preacher gets up and starts preaching, God's grace teaches you. It teaches you. It's your schoolmaster. It's your teacher. When we feel God's blessings on our life and His power and answered prayer, you know, when we do right, that's God's grace teaching us. I, I've done right and God's blessed me. He teaches that's the best thing to do. I've done wrong. He whips me. He's teaching me that's the wrong thing to do. He teaches us. I'm glad this morning for schooling grace. It helps us make the right choices. Amen. We see and know. Listen, sometimes we get upset with the world. We say, well, these crazy people out there in the world, these crazy people. But we forget people. They're blind. We can see and they can't. We forget about that a lot of times. I do. I see these. When I watch the news, when I watch a talk show, I get so mad. I think, what's wrong with you people? What's wrong? And then I forget, man. That's like trying to get a blind man to tell you if there's an organ sitting there. We can see it. They can't. If a man's blind, I can say, well, can't you see my tie? What color is that? He'll say... Orange, brown, penny, copper. What? He, he can't see it. He don't know if it's purple. He don't know if it's blue. I, but we can see it so we know. A lot of times we get mad. That's the grace of God, brother. We ought to thank God. You know, we hear these politicians get on TV and they talk about issues and we think, oh, good night. How can I be that? I mean, here are these people. I, I'll tell you, some things happened just this week. Uh, you hear about that kid that wore that Hitler outfit to school? And, you know, there's, there's uh, someone was taking a fit, you know, and everything. They're talking about freedom of speech and all that. It's funny how that they want freedom of speech on their issues, but when it comes to something that we're interested in, they don't believe in freedom of speech. And see, but we, we get mad and we preach about it, but they can't even see. They're blind by the God of this world. They say, uh, did you hear about, uh, did you hear about the, the, the woman who was pregnant? And they said this woman, uh, several months pregnant, and took a gun and put it to her stomach and shot, shot through here to kill the baby. And the news people say, they said, this is awful. This is awful. She killed her baby. They said, I caught you. That's what I said. Caught you. You called it a baby. You called it a baby. Last week on the news when you was voting, it was a fetus. Last week it was a piece of tissue. Last week it was just something. And, uh, listen, Christian, you know, the world sit there just like, oh, she killed her baby. She killed her baby. How awful. But you can kill yours, okay. You can kill yours, okay. It's a fetus. But she killed hers. It's a baby. Uh, they can't even see it. We're sitting there saying, ah, that drives us crazy. You know why? Because the grace of God teaches us what's right. I'm sitting there saying, look, lady, you ain't supposed to shoot yourself in the stomach, but they ain't one bit of depth whatsoever. And that woman shooting herself through the stomach, killing that baby, then they are sitting on an operating table and a doctor slicing that baby up and taking it out of your body. Say man right there. I'm telling you what, brother, we're guilty of killing 4,000 per day in this nation. And that's a sad thing, and it's murder every single time. You say, what if the mother was raped? It's still murder. Still murder. It don't matter how it got there, it's wrong to kill it. It don't matter if it's wanted or not to take a human life. You know, all this stem cell, Michael J., you know, all that, you know, and all his commercials he put on. I don't know how much that's good. I'm not making fun of it. But I'm telling you what, brother. Listen, they're, they're trying to use him to say, it's all right. I, I've, I, I want them to do all the stem cell resets I can without killing bro or making, making babies just to kill them. That ain't right. Amen. I'm telling you, the grace of God schools us. It schools us in teaching us what is right and what is wrong. Amen. I'm glad this morning for schooling these. It teaches us. It teaches us. That's right, brother. You know, the old song says, "'Twas grace that what? Taught 
my heart to fear. That grace teaches you. A lot of things we think about grace is just being kind to somebody. But the grace of God schools us. I'm glad for schooling grace. Number three, I want to say, what I say? First of all, saving grace. Secondly, schooling grace. Number three this morning, I want to talk about sufficient grace. Amen. Second Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9. God, Paul, my grace is sufficient. Amen. Anybody, I didn't know what that meant when I first got saved. But I'm beginning to learn the older I am that God's grace is sufficient. It's sufficient. You know, when God told Paul that, Paul was talking about his weakness. And Paul had a weakness. We know it as his thorn in the flesh. And I know if you went to 90% of the Baptist churches in this country, I, I'm, I don't, I'm different on this than a lot of preachers, but I'm, I'm waiting on somebody to show me where I'm wrong, then I'll change it. I, uh, most Baptist preachers preach that Paul's uh, thorn in the flesh was bad eyesight. I never have believed that. Don't believe it now. I don't believe the Bible teaches it. Uh, he might have had bad, bad eyesight, but that was not his thorn in the flesh. You know what he said his thorn in the flesh was? He said it was a weakness. He said it was a temptation. And he said it was a messenger of Satan. I don't know what it was, but it was not bad eyesight. You don't call bad eyesight a messenger of Satan. Bad eyesight is a temptation. He, Paul had, people say, oh, the great apostle Paul, he wasn't tempted. Oh, yes, he was. We elevate these people sometimes to Godhood, and he was a man just like me and you. Paul had something that bothered him bad. Somebody said since Paul was married that he is a homosexual. And I don't think so. I don't think he was or ever had been. Uh, you know, because he, you know, he run around with all them guys all the time. They accused Jesus of that too. They said Jesus had a crowd of uh, homosexuals that followed him around because he had 12 boyfriends. Not so. Not at all. And the grace of God will teach you the truth. And the grace of God told Paul, he said, Paul, he said, I know you got a problem, but he said, I'm going to be with you in your problem. I'm not going to take it away, but I'm going to stand with you all the way through it. I'm glad of that this morning. Ain't you glad? You know, when you first get saved, you think, well, I'm going to get perfect. I'm going to go to the altar and I'm going to get perfect and I ain't going to sin no more. And then it finally dawns on you that the harder you try, you still got this old flesh dragging around with you. And every time you get right, you'll go, uh, next day you'll mess again. And right then, where sufficient grace kicks in and said, my grace is is sufficient. Amen. Hallelujah. I'm glad for sufficient grace this morning. That's right, brother. You know what God did? God put enough money in the bank to pay for everything you'd ever do wrong. Now, we're not supposed to abuse the grace of God. We're not supposed to say, oh, well, we're saved by grace, so I can go live like a devil. That's wrong. That's wicked. But I thank God this morning that there's enough grace in the bank to pay for all my sins. You better thank God do. Amen. Amen. You know, Peter one time come to the Lord and he's talking about forgiveness. And I heard a message the other day on forgiveness. It was really a blessing. I maybe I need to preach on that sometime. You somebody that's done you wrong, you need to forgive them. The Bible said we're supposed to forgive people that do us wrong. And if you don't forgive that person, you know who it's hurting? It's hurting you. It ain't hurting them. And if you you know what it means to forgive? To let it go, never bring it up again, and act toward them just like it never had happened. And if you're not doing that, you have not forgiven. I've heard people say, well, I forgive you, but... No, you had not forgive nothing. God don't do that. God don't say, I forgive you, but... Oh, I'm going to knock it off anyway. God forgives and He puts it away. Have in mind, the only way you can do that is by the grace of God. Well, anyway, Peter came to the Lord one time and he said, Lord, how often shall I forgive my brother? He said, if somebody does me wrong, how many times I got to forgive them before I kill them? Until seven times? Now, somebody said this. Somebody said it was a Jewish custom in those days that the Jews, you know, Jews had rules on everything. They had, they had more rules than they could even write down. They had more laws. Lord, they might Sabbath day's journey and how much you could do and what you couldn't do and all that. The Jews had a law that you had to forgive a person three times. But they said, after the third time, do whatever you want to do. If anybody wronged you once, you had to forgive them. If they wronged you twice, you had to forgive them. You three times, you had to forgive them by law. After that, one more time, I cut your head off, I'll kill you, don't you ever speak to me again. Whatever you want to do was okay. So Peter really thought he was being religious. 
when he stretched that thing out to seven. Can't you imagine? Everybody in that day believed three times, and after that you could do whatever. Well, Peter steps up there and said, Boy, I know you, Jesus. I know you. You know where I, what I'm heading to with this, don't you? I'm, telling you? I'm about to shout just thinking about it. Oh, Peter went to the Lord one night and he said, Now, Lord, we all believe three times. We all believe the person sins us three times. we got to forgive us. But, Lord, you're the great one. You stretch it out. You're better than anybody else. Seven times, right? Peter thought that's what the Lord will say. Seven will go, whoa, how righteous he is. Whoa, how good he is. But that ain't what he said. Glory to God. Brother, if I don't make you shout, I mean, listen, that'd make a dead Presbyterian holler amen. I'm telling you, hallelujah. Oh, Peter looked down and he said, Lord, he said, if somebody sins seven times, how about that? Everybody went, good night, Peter. You're more right with God than anybody ever seen. You forgive somebody seven times? And the Lord looked back and he said, no, Peter. He said, that ain't what I'm saying. He said, how about until 70 times 7? 70 times 7. And everybody went, oh my goodness. And that somebody tell me how many that is. 490 times in one day. The next day you start all over again. He said what he said, brother. And you say, well, my wife, if she ever does that again, okay. My husband, I, he runs his mouth. He throws him dirty socks in the floor and I'm sick of it. Huh? 70 times 7 in one day. If he turn and say, I repent, thou shalt forgive him. Now, the Lord wasn't saying that you count them up and that's 491 you can kill. Ain't nobody going to do you 490 times in one day. You know what he meant? Endless. Endless. It just goes on and on. And that's the way the sufficient grace of God is this morning. I'm telling you, sometimes you get down. Sometimes you make the same mistake over and over and a devil jump on you and say, God ain't going to forgive you this time. He forgive you them other times, but not this time. How many has the devil ever told that? I'm going to tell you, glory to God, hallelujah, until seven. Seventy times seven. The grace of God is endless. It's endless. There's a bountiful supply. And if you'll confess it, God will forgive it this morning. You say, oh, Brother Danny, you don't know how many times I've committed to sin. Don't care. I don't care. You confess it. God's grace is sufficient to take it away. Let me say, fourthly this morning, I'm going to talk for a minute about sustaining grace. Second Timothy 1, nine, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to His own purpose and grace. Sustaining grace. Lord, have mercy. Not according to our works. How, what makes missionaries stay on the field? Sustaining grace. What makes ladies live for God when their husband's mean as a devil and their kids rebel and she gets cussed for coming to church? Sustaining grace. What makes a teenager, they'll take a stand for God and take their Bible to school. Like some of ours did. You know, we had kids wearing them camp meeting sweatshirts, Bible school and everything. That's the camp meeting. Some of them got on fire. You know what helps them do that? Sustaining grace. Amen. I'm not talking about just coming up here and crying a few tears, getting excited and leaving and going home. I'm talking about something that will last you into tomorrow and Tuesday and Wednesday. You ought to be feast off this thought all week long. Just chew it up like a cow chewing her cud, brother, and just feast off the grace of God. Hallelujah. Sustaining grace. Sustaining grace. Just keep you going. Just keep you going. I thought about men that I've heard of, like Job, who kept going, the grace of God. Corey Ten Boom, the great Christian who was thrown in Nazi concentration camp over there when the Jew, when the Germans invaded Holland. You know that story, The Hiding Place. You never read that book? Have you never seen that video, the movie, The Hiding Place? Everybody in here, watch it. The Hiding Place. The grace of God. Took care of Corey Ten Boom and her sister through the most unbelievable circumstances. I mean, food deprivation, torture, chamber. I mean, life, guilt, ridicule. They made fun of them. You know that one story where she had a Bible on her and she, they, they went through and they searched them. You know, they had to go through completely stark naked. All those women, they stripped them up so they couldn't snuggle anything in. And somehow the guard got distracted and she walked right through with a Bible like that right there. That's God's grace taking care of her. It's a grace of that's kept those missionaries on that field without food. They said one time, uh, this missionary come down and she's crawling in these filthy huts in Africa and telling these kids about Jesus. And some American tourists come over there and said, what are you doing? She said, I live my life here. I live my life here. This is my life. She said, I wouldn't do that for a million dollars. And the missionary said, I wouldn't either. <laughs> Good answer, ain't it? I wouldn't either, but I'd do it for Jesus. Because He's done so much for me. Woo! 
Amen. Thank God that's, that's sustaining grace. Let me tell you something. I, I won't take much time on this. I'll give you one more than through. Listen, there's been times in my life when I felt like I run out of gas spiritually. Then a lot of times, and you'll, you'll be honest, you'll tell me the same things happen to you. I've got down and I think, Lord, have mercy. I can't do this. God, this, it, the task is too great. I am not physically, mentally, or spiritually able to do what I've got to do. Dear God, dear God, I've just had it. I've just had it. And for a split second there, you think, good enough, there ain't no use in trying. And when that happens, and I lay down, listen to me, and I lay down, and I sort of give up the fight, and think, I just can't go on. I can't do it. I can't study. I can't pray. The devil's got me. He's on top of me. About that time. Whoa! Hallelujah! That's sustaining grace. The grace of God's what sustained me down through the years. I make no claim to fame, brother. Old brother Danny done nothing. But God's grace that saved me, that schooled me, that's sufficient for me, has sufficiently sustained me through the years. One more and I'm through. This one's in the future. I'm going to talk about surpassing grace. The Bible said in Ephesians 2.7, that in the ages to come, in the ages to come, things still going to be working that He started in you. It will be, Kelsey saying it just right. One day He's going to make us. Little boy got saved at Nebo Baptist in the Bible. Man and his wife got saved here in the altar, shining light. Man, he got saved right here. And He's going to polish us up, put us up on... Heaven's display, and all angels go, who is that? Who is that? He's going to say, trophies of grace. Just like she put that little trophy up here, and everybody looking at it, they're going to put us up there one day, and everybody, everybody in heaven, the seraphim, brother, the cherubim, and blims, and blims, and whoever else is up there. Amen. All the creatures up there in heaven, and brother, everybody's going to say, who is them people, and where'd they come from? And the Lord's going to say, I'm trophies of grace. Amen. When we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, brother, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. We'll sing a song, Grace, Grace, God's Grace. Grace that repardons and cleanses within. Grace, Grace, God's Grace. Grace that is greater than all my sin. That's surpassing grace. Surpassing grace. We can find grace to help in time of need. Do you need grace this morning? Is there somebody here to say, Brother Danny, my life just went to the dogs. I'm, I'm in a mess. I need help. I got news for you. There's grace. There's grace. I talk about saving grace. I talk about schooling grace. I talk about sufficient grace. Sustaining grace. Thank God there's surpassing grace. Let's stand with our heads bowed.